Thank you, Shelly. I'm really, really happy to be here. Anyone who follows me on uh, social media knows I'm a self-proclaimed CMO and geek, so this is like nirvana for me. Um, and uh, I love the coveted after lunch spot, so let's get this party started and everybody wake up. Um, so uh, before I introduce this brilliance on the stage, let me give you a little bit of setting the stage. So um, we all know we live in a world today where the manner in which we live essentially leaves a trail of breadcrumbs behind us every waking moment. Um, and we know that, you know, like the Geico ad says, everybody knows that. And I think, in fact, everyone does know that. Consumers, not just in this room of super advertising um, geniuses. People out there know, and they know, and as Shelley said, they accept that if the value exchange um, is there for them. Um, so it's kind of like a dance, and I would argue, and we can talk about this if you disagree, but I, I would argue it's a dance of equals. Both know they have something to give and to gain um, from the other, and it really does take two to tango. And the good news is when that dance works right, it's magic. It's magic for marketing. It's magic for the consumer. Um, and so here's why the next 27-ish, 27 and 29 second time period is going to be magic. Because this is not going to be uh, the panel that you expect. Sorry, Shelley. Um, we're actually going to talk about, not about theoretical big data or the problems with privacy and, and um, opt-in, opt-out. Um, we have three people, which really is a trifecta of, um, of innovation on this stage, to talk about what they are doing today, right now, to mine those breadcrumbs we all leave in our wake to actually do really innovative um, and effective things. Um, and so let me introduce each one so that you know who they are. Um, over on my far left is Lisa Caputo. Lisa is the EVP and Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at the Travelers Companies, Inc. Um, and Lisa is using insights uh, to drive uh, her company's content marketing strategies to really surprise and delight what is a very connected customer uh, today while operating in probably one of the most highly regulated industries there is. And so she's got a lot to share about how she does that appropriately and, frankly, effectively. Um, Phil Weiser, to my left. Um, this is a problem with flashcards. I'm going to drop them all. Um, Phil Weiser is Hearst, the Hearst Corporation's first CTO. Um, he came to the company about almost three years ago, two and a half years ago, um, and is really driving the digital strategy, technology innovation, and new business endeavors at a massive global uh, company of great brands and great content. Um, Phil sees a world led by data, in his own words, um, and a better content and advertising future because of it. Um, and you'll be interested in what he has to share. And Vikram Samaya is um, from the Weather Channel. He is the, gen uh, the Weather Company, sorry. He is the general manager of Weather FX um, and probably sitting on the biggest gold mine of data there is, weather. And I have a very serious bone to pick with Vikram today. Um, <laughs> Because it's actually fascinating, I'll, I'll end with this little story, it's fascinating to understand the correlation between weather and human beings and what they do and what they buy, beyond the obvious, like buying your 100th umbrella or um, uh, rain shoes, boots. Um, so here's what I found, right? So it's really rainy today. I'll, I'll call it extreme rain. Here's how we're all feeling and what's happening in the world because of that. So first of all, the stock market goes down in ra on rainy days, and as a public company, Tremor thanks you for that, Vikram. Um, human conflict and crime goes up. Um, moods go down. People in bad mood get really uh, cranky. Uh, frizz goes up, and I, I'm sure some of you understand that. But interestingly, empathy goes up. We tip bigger on rainy days. So essentially, and, I, and I'm sure you'll agree, you are all cranky, poor, picking fights, um, but really feeling bad for each other. And so um, I'm actually going to start with Vikram, since he brought this weather on us, um, with a first question. I have a question for each of you, and then we'll, we'll get into wherever that takes us. 
So you're sitting on this massive data base of weather, and arguably, as you said, it's actually maybe the only um, gold mine of data where people don't really care about privacy, right? Like weather is weather and we love understanding how to predict it and how to track it and how to see what's about to happen. Um, and and um, we know that weather gives us really strong correlations that can be applied to advertising. So I'd like you to actually paint a picture um, for us of how you're helping marketers, how you're thinking about um, that data and how to leverage that uh, for better advertising and content tomorrow. Yeah, maybe I, rather than plugging my own product, I think what I'll talk about is how we got to where we got to, which is when we thought about what we could do with weather data, as people can do with any really primary data set, what we wanted to think about was we are selling to marketers, and when we're talking to them, we want to talk to them about how their consumers are behaving and how they can better engage with them, because in the end, that's what we're, what, that's what they, we're there for. And so what we were able to do with weather was to actually build correlations around how certain weather conditions made people feel, made people behave, made people do certain things, and we could prognosticate. We could look out into the future at least two weeks. And those few small seeds grew into an oak when we actually were able to go to our clients, like Lisa and others, and work with them to build programs that made sense and build programs that allowed them to interact with any of their users through a variety of different uh, uh, mediums that we offered them. Cable, digital, mobile. We've heard multiple times about sort of the power of mobile. And it was this combination for us of weather and location that became incredibly compelling. And they were from small things. For example, in Texas, we found that a certain dew point would have people start buying bug spray. Why? Because that's when the insects hatched, right? So it was a very simple, organic reference. But what my data scientists keep telling me was, why do you care what the story is? Right? The coolest part to big data sometimes is that's just how people behave. And when we're able to sort of get in between them and one of those million decisions they're making over the course of the day, should I have a salad? Should I go outside? Should I wear a sweater? Should I commute with my children on a bicycle or should I take them in the car? All of those give us an opportunity to say, here is a way you can do it using a brand that we represent in a way that will make sense for you. And in the end, that's what we want marketing to be, presenting sensible choices to consumers who have to make a decision. Can I just chime in there? Because um, <clears throat> just to build on Vikram's point, we, we are at Travelers in what is a great partnership with the weather company. It's, it's been a couple of years now. Um, and when David Kenny uh, went over to the weather company and I went over to Travelers, you know, we had both worked together previously. And when I saw that they had you know, launched such a robust program digitally, I called David and said, you can't do anything else with anybody in my, in my industry until we talk. And, and we've used their data um, in, a, in a very compelling way. Um, we're doing a lot of things digitally with, with the weather company. We're using the open Facebook graph around what's called My Friends Weather, where our independent agents, they're not our employees, but they're independent agents, can actually track their own uh, clients and customers who may be in the path of a hurricane. We at Travelers can then feed in content that's very relevant to that um, weather event. We um, uh, are a very proud uh, partner and sponsor of the PGA Tour and annually have a very large a signature PGA event called the Travelers Championship. And one of the things we did with the weather company's hyper-local uh, abilities, you know, through, through data was to go by zip code um, in our efforts to get ticket sales, you know, up because we donate the proceeds to charity in the communities in the greater Hartford and New England area was to flag people um, what the weather forecast was be, it would be if it was a nice day, they'd get, you know, we, we would be able to communicate with them to encourage them to come to the tournament. If, if rain was on the cusp of happening, we could communicate to them and, and, and let them know what kind of gear to bring um, if they were going to come. So it's an example, I think, of having a richness of data where marketers like me can leverage that and make us much more relevant to the consumer. So when I was speaking with you earlier, you, you call yourselves content marketers. The traveler's approach is, is really to supply 
things that enrich and inform your consumer's life. How do you measure, what are the performance metrics? How do you know what's working and what, what isn't? You know, we're, we've put quite a bit of um, analytics and metrics, you know, at our core we are, we are underwriters, right? So um, analytics and metrics are critical to the way the business is run. We're in the risk management business. Um, so we have, you know, a digital insight stream where we look at questions and intent around search. We look um, at um, how, um, through our own content dashboard, the engagement with it, the click-throughs, all of that to see um, how people are engaging with the content, what's relevant, what isn't, um, what's popping, what isn't. So um, we, we keep a very close tab on that. Secondly, you know, we try to stay very relevant to events. They may not be insurance related events, but they may be breaking news events where we can get into that conversation and use it as a way, um, for example, to be relevant to, to, to the topic at hand. So some time ago, for example, there was a a story, kind of an endearing story about a woman whose wedding ring was lost 20 years ago and it washed up on the shores of a beach somewhere, I can't recall where, and it was kind of all over USA Today and kind of made its way around the social channels. We saw it, we grabbed it, we used it as an opportunity to to talk about wedding insurance and the need for, for wedding insurance. So it's, again, I, I, I have a mantra which is contact Con content is king and context is queen. You've got to, you, you have to have robust, compelling content, but you have to be contextually relevant. And if you do that wisely, you can shout louder than you spend, right? And build a perceptual scale for your brand without spending, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Yep. So, okay, so Phil, content and context. So, you started at the company some two and a half years ago, and when right. um, what struck me when we were chatting was what you've accomplished in those two and a half years to now be ready to leverage the power of a world led by data as it relates to the content process and creation, as well as an advertising experience and how Hearst monetizes that great content. Can you first talk about those first two steps um, that took two and a half years or so to build in order to position you for the future. Sure, and, and um, just for context, when I joined Hearst, I really had no background in publishing and certainly not in digital ad tech, and I think that gave me a fresh perspective on, frankly, all the smoke and mirrors that has been going on around data in the industry. And, um, you know, I looked in and looked at, you know, all of these different numbers that were flying around the company. And what I saw, and I'm sure everybody can point out one person that they work with that always walks into the meeting and they quote a bunch of numbers to lead you down a path that they already wanted to take you down. Um, and that's what I felt was happening in the industry around data. It was just a lot of bullshit. And so we cut through that and I said, well, data should be about getting to the truth, getting to what's really happening, and pushing the noise to the side and getting to the signal that really matters. So you know, one thing that I did when I came into the company was say, well, we need to get this information in one spot so that we can start really answering the right questions around this. So we went to every single property in the company, or about 220 businesses within the Hearst portfolio. We wired every single one of them up into a centralized audience platform. And we stripped out all the parasites that were stripping data off of our properties. I actually had one uh, property in Hearst that had over 100 tags on it from third parties. At every click, they were just dropping cookies and pulling data out of our system. And then, you know, presumably in some other business model trying to sell against us in a, in a different marketplace. So we cleaned all that up. And um, we found that you know, we, we have across our portfolio about 220 million uniques per month that we could start getting really interesting data on. And it, it had to go beyond the click-throughs, because the click-throughs are kind of a, you know, a, a lightly correlated number to anything that helps you figure out how to deliver great experiences. So we started looking at what people were clicking on, but actually starting to look at what they were reading, how they were reading it. We put tools in place to look at how people scan the page so we can get deeper insight into what they care about. And we even went as far as looking at what they, interact with in the old world. So we looked at our traditional magazine subscriptions 
And we started looking at in geo information around that and inferring things that we could build into the digital world. And the result that we saw was like, you know, we had a real opportunity, particularly in programmatic advertising, to do something meaningful. Um, because we could now go in and optimize. Because I think we've heard a lot about programmatic today. I mean, that's kind of like saying, you know, yeah, I, I bought something on NASDAQ. I mean, the, the, the real power is in the math that you apply to optimize using that real-time platform. So we actually built a trading desk and started generating meaningful revenue on the company within a couple of months because we had all of this insight in our, our audience platform. And that, you know, is one example. The other key thing, which I'm sure we'll get into, is, is then using that to deliver great experiences. It's one thing to understand what people would do. It's something, I think, much more profound to change what they will do and deliver experiences that are powerful. And we're just at the beginning of that right now. So to jump on top of that as well. So Going back to what the, the, the panel is about, thinking about content and thinking about data and then thinking about audiences, when we went into the weather company and we, you know, we're massively transforming what we're doing front end and back end, we said, how are we going to look at each of these things independently? So we looked at the content piece and we brought in a guy named Neil Katz who worked at CBS and Huffington Post. And this was on the cover of, of, of Business Week a couple of weeks ago. It was me and Neil talking about how on the content side, we looked at all the adjacencies of weather, right? Animals, science, engineering. And we started doing a lot of content generation using that data and grew our content 1,000% within the first six months, right? On the data side, what we said was we shouldn't be limited to our own network even. We should be looking at what the data engine is generating. And then to Lisa's point, find the right context, whether it's on our network or outside it. So WeatherFX, the platform we built for weather, actually has DSP links out into the wild world of digital and mobile inventory. And we actually built our own version of a TV DSP as well. So we could buy network spot inventory off our own network when the context demanded it. The last piece we did was we also said, what can all these other data insights generate across the company? And how should we be using them, right? And so we have applications that inform our insurance companies when hail is going to come into the area and ask them to pull their cars into their garages, right? We have applications that tell planes when there's going to be turbulence. And now, this is actually where I'm going to disagree with Owen. I actually think a lot of money is going to go into shopper marketing and location-specific marketing for resale. A ton of money. We're doing a lot of work around location. We have 140 million downloads of our app. 75% of you check it three times a day or more. Today, you're checking it all the time, right? On a bad day, 50 to 60% of our traffic comes through our mobile applications. And we're doing a ton of work to ensure that whether you have a Samsung phone or an iPhone, uh, we are the person delivering that weather information to you. Um, so when we wanted to make sure that we could utilize that data in the most effective way possible, we're now beginning to think about how do beacons work? How does internal understandings of how you want to work in a retail store versus what's going on in the environment right outside it? Because as a content creator and as a, as a sort of a large data provider, what we've realized is if we continue to operate like a standard media corporation has been, we are dooming ourselves to extinction despite the fact that in our particular case, you know, to a large extent, we own our vertical. Um, and so what we said was, we need to find ways to essentially make money while we sleep in a variety of different ways across the board, not just through our obvious media properties like the Weather Channel and Weather.com and our app, but we should be thinking about how we're working within retailers, how we're working for insurance companies, how we're working for auto dealerships who want to push today the SUV, tomorrow the convertible in real time, because that's how people make decisions in real time. I would agree with that. But we, when we look at the shift to mobile, and we shifted the 50% mobile on average across our whole properties this year, the concept of location has become more and more important. And we're actually starting to filter content based on geo and even you know, the context of, of retail where we've got partners there. So I would agree with you that geo is really important. So you guys are both mentioning uh, content creation. And let's get back to, again, what Shelly was talking about this value exchange, this tango where they're willing to dance if what they're getting in return is of high value to them, however they define that. So let's talk about creative. Is I would ask, is data, is this sort of breadcrumbs that are coming, and on mobile now it's exponentially more breadcrumbs coming at all of us, um, clues, hints, insights. Is it really going to make creative better? Is it really going to make... Um, a video on a Hearst site better? How are, how, because I don't think we've yet seen data and insights like we're all talking about programmatic. Nobody, you know, the hot topic yet isn't 
wow, the creative guys are now all over data to create six different TV ads no, based but, on but data No, but I think insights. they have been, right? Whether it's data sitting in some creative's wetware around what they know about consumers and what they know about how to talk to them, or it's a new set of data that we're bringing now, I think it's the same thing. The difference was, once upon a time, this data sat in some musty encyclopedia on a, you know, on a shelf, and you weren't sure how to access it all. Today, you can do a search and figure out exactly what you need from all the new sets of tools you have around how a consumer is going to behave, what are the catalysts that will provoke them to do something. Creatives now have that. And what I've seen working in the data space, though I started at a creative agency uh, run by a guy named Cliff Freeman who came up with you know, pizza, Little Caesar's Pizza Pizza, right? So that was, that was my first job. We saw the greatest failures with data happen when the creative didn't, um, didn't encompass what the data was trying to tell them. Now, creatives really have the best of both worlds. In theory, what should be happening and is happening is that the creative gets more sophisticated, smarter, more targeted, and the creatives embrace this stuff in a pretty significant way. And I think that's, that, that causal link has been happening since day one. It's I just agree. nice to talk about big data. I, I, I agree. I, I think you see any good marketer, in my view, is going to ground themselves in insights and research when developing creative. And you're going to build into your creative development those um, those points in time in that development where you're going to do the gut check with you know market research whether you're going to check the the script you're going to check uh, check the creative in pre-production all of it you're going to have those research checkpoints now with the, with with data you're you're feeding in a whole more granular set of insights that only makes the day the the creative development finer and better and you can segment. There's a whole segmentation now that can happen with the convergence of data such that you can custom tailor your, your creative messaging to those audiences. I'll take it a step further. Um, you know, I think you saw in presidential pol politics the last go around the importance of data, right, when targeting your media buys. And look what the Obama campaign did, which is they they went and they developed out their creative and their messaging based on insights and research and data. But then they took it a step further, which is they used that data to actually target the 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 undecideds, and they went to to figure out what shows on television the undecideds were watching and at what time. And they went in there very surgically with 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 ads at those times you know, to, to target those undecideds on, on television shows and on networks where the opponent was nowhere to be found. So that they had a direct shot at the undecided or independent voter and move them. It was, you know, brilliant. And I think in so many ways has revolutionized now the way um, political campaigns are run. And I, I would just build on that too and say it's, it's about the change in the creative process. And the example I look at are the, the young artists that are very successful. Okay, thank you. Somebody tripped over a wire back there, I can see it. <laughs> Um, what I was saying was that um, when we look at creative in terms of you know the content the creators that we're looking for, we look to the YouTube uh, performers, and you look at the process that they use. It's this very iterative process that's high speed, and it's a conversation. So when they're creating their content, they're looking at the feedback they're getting in real time from the audience and then doing the next version. So as, as Vikram pointed out, we had data, but the feedback loop, let's say for broadcast television, would be looking at Nielsen and then a week later trying to adapt to it. And it was a pretty inefficient process. Now you can get that feedback almost instantly. And we're only hiring in now on the digital side creative that really can do both, of, both sides of this. They really look into the data, use that to inform what they're creating, and are constantly iterating on it. So it's a, it's a different type of person. I, yeah, I guess it's BuzzFeed's whole model, right? Like, I'm curious how iterative the process is now. So you talked a lot about the targeting and, the, and how you can be more surgical. Are you feeding back to your creative agency? I mean, honestly, in digital, you know within hours um, if that piece of creative is working better against whatever your KPI is versus another. Are you seeing that feedback? It sounds like you are. Your, def your editorial is definitely Absolutely. getting more yeah. in the habit of that. 
Are we seeing that applied back if to you, television you're not slash it, video? You're toast, right? I mean, if you're not thinking about how what the impact of your content is on your audience is, because again, the audience is the product in a lot of ways, you are you are you're letting yourself in for trouble. And there are companies now that are getting so smart about building analytics around it. There's a company called Simple Reach that does viral analytics, right, to show you how quickly your, your your stories are being pushed out. There are companies that are being smart about allowing SDKs into your mobile apps so you can in incorporate new kinds of analytics really quickly, like and particle and localytics and things like that. So it, it becomes a case of there's a whole series of interconnected analytic applications that you can build or that you can buy uh, that is enabling smart content producers to think about how they need to work in a world where the cycle time is getting smaller on everything, whether it's Fortune 500 company, like Frank was talking about earlier, or whether it's the cycle time to how quickly your content is gonna stay live and viral in the world mm -hmm. out there. And in the end, when we're trying to speak for the marketers, you only get so many opportunities, time is finite. So a related topic in our last minute and 20 seconds, personalization, um, individualization of, of video and display and recommendation engines. Is it gonna work long term? This was actually came from a conversation with you, Phil. Is, um, you know, is it working now? Are you seeing it working? When is it working? When does it not work? Because it seems like everything is hyper personalized now. Um, and I'm being thrown a million things every day. If you like this, you like this, you like this. And I'm curious how Hearst is approaching that and if you're seeing that in your marketing efforts. Yeah, yeah we, we, we do believe that being intelligent and understanding the context of the individual is gonna be really important. So one thing that we do now, just to start figuring this out, is we just look at recommendations of related content within the context of something that's already being consumed and based on that individual, we'll make recommendations out to them as well. Um, I think that you know, longer term, the consumer expects that level of personalization. I think the, the best example in the market right now is Facebook. Um, what they've done in terms of auto-curating the feed that you receive every day has produced dramatically positive results for them. Um, they have you know, very deep data and context, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's a given that you will have to do some level of personalization if you want to survive in content. The cool part is everyone thinks they're in a segment of one, right? <laughs> and as long as they feel that way, you're in good shape, but they're not. And, and, and that's what gives us an advantage in, in terms of saying there is data inequality today between the, the people who know the, who own the data and consumers out there. But millennials especially are becoming very smart about knowing when they're gonna give up that data in return for something else. So if you don't have the right kind of value to trade for, they're not gonna give you what you want. And it's a very clean transaction. Mm -hmm. There's something very, 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 uh, uh, very uh, optimistic about that, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So ending on an optimistic note, can each of you just sort of summarize why uh, we're in for a better brand marketing and content creation world because of what's happening in data? Why is it getting better? Well, I think we'll, we'll start seeing experiences that are delivered to consumers that surprise and delight them. And that doesn't happen a lot in, in these days. But um, I think as we get smarter with that, you're going to see things that really matter. And it's just starting to happen now. Uh, the, the Internet of Things really, really fascinates me. So there's this notion I'll get up in the morning and my closet will tell me what to wear, and my fridge will tell me what to eat, and my, my children's stroller will tell me what to do with my commute. And as, an, as a futurist and as a sci-fi buff, like that's a world I wanna live in. And, and because I get to work at the weather company, we also get to talk about climate and all the cool stuff that we wanna prevent from happening. So that's, that's kind of why I'm excited about data, because it enables all those conversations. Lisa? So I think, um, you know, to, to take a step further, the Internet of Things, the shared economy, is going to make a, a, a much more customer-centric cent society, right? And I think that um, that's a great opportunity for marketers and for companies. And I would envision and hope, both as a consumer um, and as a marketer, that we'll see a movement um, away from product centricity and more toward being focused on the customer. Um, there's a lot of talk about it. But um, in reality, unfortunately, many companies don't, don't do it. Um, and I think that the millennials in particular and the future uh, customers to come are going to demand the customer centricity because, you know, it is. It's, all, it's the you generation. So I envision it'll be more customer-centric. Great. Terrific. How about a round of applause for these three?